Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Happy Halloween! We did it! We're alive! We're alive on Halloween! Nobody got ghouled or ghosted or bitten in the neck by a vampire. Two hearts that you couldn't come here anymore. That's nice. Good, guys. Uh, all right. So, hello. Hopefully, everybody is in the right room. Uh, so, we're here talking tonight about... Cultism. Everybody's aware of this? Yes? Good. Okay. Great. Great, great. Uh, can I get a show of hands for everybody? Um, whose first time is it here to the Philosophy Forum right now? Golden. Yeah, about a third of us. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Um, did everybody get the... Beautiful. Thank you very much. Well, then, without further ado, drum roll, please. Thank you. I introduce you to the wacky and wild world of a Thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, hey, True, could you talk to Chung for me and have him set out some more of these blue chairs, please? I can see that people are already getting a little too snug, a little too snug in here. Cool, well, alrighty, friends. All right, so um, I'd like to let you know the things that we're going to be covering here tonight. Uh, a little bit of a roadmap. Like always, I think that I've prepared a little bit too much for you. So on the fly, I'm probably gonna have to choose a few things that unfortunately, we don't get to cover, but uh, but we'll see. So first, of course, the haiku and drawing contest. That's all been taken care of. Uh, the first real discussion that we're going to have will be on what occultism is, just to make sure that we're all on a relatively similar understanding starting off. Um, after that, we're going to be having a, a, a talk on the history of occultism, starting way back with the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the German Renaissance. It should be pretty cool. Help us, help us understand what occultism is like today. Um, after that, we're going to be looking at a piece from Laura Hardy Stewart, who's been making a lot of artwork for us. This one is called Capra Occulta, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, is anybody in here familiar with Discordianism, by chance? Discordianism? No? Pretty cool occult beliefs came in about the 1950s, a part of spiritual anarchy, uh, which I'm excited to share with you guys. Uh, after that, we're going to take a look at chaotic. You could spend years just scratching the surface of any of these topics, so I don't think there were we're going to get to most of it today, uh, but hopefully I'll give you a, a fair introduction. Uh, Jennifer Kingsley, who I think is on her way, she's not quite here yet, she's prepared some, uh, some tarot cards for us. She's actually designed them by hand, and she wants to show them off and uh, let her know about her own personal journey with tarot. Um, after that, we have uh, a fortune teller. Oh, sorry. We're actually going to talk about general fortune tellers in Vietnam, the way that they operate, how you can find them. Um, after that, we're going to have uh, some fortune telling and dead ancestor communication with Lung Zhang Lau. Uh, this, I think, is going to be one of the highlights of the evening. Uh, highlight number two is going to be channeling spirits with Ko Dao Tao. Sorry if I ruined that pronunciation. <laughs> um, but uh, this is what we have on the docket tonight, guys, so please stick around. I'm going to try to get you out of here as close to 10 o'clock as possible. Uh, there's a chance that we'll actually wrap up around 10, 15, 20, 10, 20, something like that. I hope that's okay. So sit on back, enjoy the ride, grab a beer if you can, say hello to your neighbor, and I hope that we all leave here learning a little bit of something about the occult. We all leave here with a new friend, and uh, maybe the chance to talk to one of our dead grandparents. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> all right, guys. So first of all, what is occultism? What, what is it? What is it? Would anybody like to start us off? One person. What do you think? Yeah, true. Uh, I Wikipedia'd it, and it was basically <laughs> magic. Anything that science can't explain is what Wikipedia was saying. Occultism is anything that science can't explain. And then does all religion fall in the realm of occultism, then, you think? I would say not, because religion has dogma, religion has dogma and deities, and this doesn't necessarily. Okay, all right, interesting, interesting. Anybody else have an idea of what occultism is? Uh, yeah, can we pass the microphone back to this gentleman here? I've been, I haven't read too much about it, but from what I understand, it's a way of like sharing knowledge somehow throughout the ages, right? A sort of religion, but without being religion. Um, yeah, I don't know. 
Okay, so we're sharing knowledge, but of course it's not the same as some kind of regular institution that allows us to share knowledge, but it's a special kind of knowledge. So, so let's dive in there. I think those, that's, that's a really good place to start. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I think that's a good place to start. Um, okay, so occultism, yeah, it's a pretty hard thing to really put your finger on. I don't think that we, it's possible to necessarily say, this is occultism, this is not occultism. But uh, through all of my research, it seems that occultism is an umbrella term that's used to categorize practices that do not fit into religion or into science. So this is things like spiritualism, theosophy, anthroposophy, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, if anybody's heard of that. Pretty cool, we won't really get into that tonight, but I suggest it. Uh, New Age, palm reading, fortune telling, channeling, scrying, vampires, fairies, even UFOs. Some of the beliefs about UFOs can be considered a part of the occult. Uh, so if we, look at, uh, if we look at the etymology of the word occult, um, uh, sorry, a definition of the, the word occult would really mean knowledge of the hidden or knowledge of the paranormal. Knowledge of the paranormal. Uh, so the paranormal is anything that people have experienced that cannot be explained by science, that can only be explained by word of mouth, by people saying what they've experienced. That's the paranormal. And the occult is the knowledge of this kind of knowledge. Knowledge uh, or of these kinds of experiences. So uh, the etymology, the word is Latin, it's Latin word occultus, uh, which means a clandestine, hidden, or secret. And in general, these are ways that are used to figure out the way that the world works. The way that the world works. Now, of course, we only really seek knowledge so that we can try to control things. So we want to understand the fundamental way that the world works so that we can begin to, to control the way that the world works, normally for some kind of personal gain. In the 16th century, uh, there was this propping up of something called the occult sciences. Today, when we think about occultism and when we think about science, we think of them as being kind of on two opposite sides of the spectrum. But as we'll see in a little bit, uh, the history of occultism and of science are pretty well interlinked. There wasn't a clear distinction between science and occultism for a very long time. Uh, so the occult sciences were things like astrology, alchemy, and natural magic. And these are practices that were practiced for a very long time, very up until very recently, were these not considered to be a part of the normal academic sciences. In the 19th century, the word occultism uh, was starting to be used in France, and it was associated with various French esoteric groups connected with Eliphas Levi. Does anybody know Levi? Have you read him before? Nobody? Okay, oh no. It's a great place, great place to start with understanding occultism, uh, and also a gentleman called Papou. Uh, the word occultism was first used in English all the way up to 1875 by an, esoter an esotericist named Helena Blavatsky. Any questions about any of those things that were covered? Yes, please. Uh, so understanding, uh, the question was, what is an esotericist? So an esotericist is someone who practices esotericism. Esotericism is, um, uh, it's very difficult to understand the difference between occultism and esotericism. Generally, these two words are used interchangeably. They're used synonymously. Esotericism are practices that allow us to understand uh, the fundamental energy and forces of the universe uh, that, are not, um, that are not recognized by conventional sciences. Yeah, so the, the definition of esotericism and the occult are basically the same. Um, one of the real differences, though, between esotericism and occultism is that occultism, uh, it says that science is okay. Uh, it doesn't try to prove that any part of science is wrong. In fact, it says mostly everything that scientists say is correct, uh, except for the fact when they try to argue with occultists. Um, but other than that, they agree with everything. That's, so uh, occultism isn't necessarily anti-scientific. Um, uh, Nash, I'm sorry to keep having you, you run little errands for us. Could we just grab Chuang there? Could we just have him turn on the fans for us, please? It seems like it's getting really hot. It seems like these fans just aren't working at all. Thank you very much. Is that Chung? Yeah, that's Chung. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you guys. Is everybody feeling kind of hot right now? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get to we'll get to. And it looks like and Nash also this uh, this AC unit also isn't turned on. Maybe you could help us out with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, in addition to the occult sciences, there are also things called occult qualities. And occult qualities are, po are properties that have no known rational explanation. So when we find things in science, think of like Schrodinger's cat, let's say, where we don't really understand why what's going on is going on, then it can all of a sudden be lumped into this big category of things with occult qualities. So even, Magnetism, that is the, the power that attracts two magnets together, and gravity were both considered to be occult at their inception. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton was terrified to let people know about his discovery of gravity because he thought that he would be accused of being an occultist. People would think that it was this kind of parascience, not real science, uh, so he didn't let it out. Uh, as I said, occultism can be separated from esotericism by its belief that science isn't necessarily wrong. It's not anti-science. Um, it doesn't reject scientific progress or modernity. And in fact, as we'll see, much of the scientific method comes from alchemy, which is now considered to be a part of occultism. So uh, Levi, um, who, has, who wrote many books that we still consider today to be kind of the, the Bibles of occultism, uh, Levi recognized that we need to solve the conflict between science and religion. Uh, he recognized, much like Nietzsche or any of the existentialists, that since the death of religion, there's a huge void that's left in culture that needs to be filled somehow. And d does anybody agree with that, that science has left a kind of void in culture? This half of the room is all of our conservatives over here. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, he, like many people, believed that there was this void and that we needed to solve this conflict between science and religion. And he said that we could do this by consulting ancient wisdoms that were found in magic. Uh, he said that, again, ancient magic was really linked together with science. The, the kind of strange paradoxes and things that seem so superstitious in many religions aren't actually found in magic. Magic, at least by its practitioners, really is considered to be a science and follows the scientific method. Um, so Antoine Favor, who's a scholar of esotericism, he says that rather than accepting, quote, the triumph of scientism, that is, the belief in science like it's a religion, rather than accepting the, the triumph of scientism, occultists sought an alternative solution trying to integrate scientific progress or modernity with a global vision that will serve to make the vacuousness of materialism more apparent. So we're trying to point out how if we're only focused on the material world, if we're only focused on um, what can be proven scientifically through observation, then we're going to be left with a big void uh, in our hearts, let's say, um, that, science used to be, that science used to fill. Um, this is referred to as disenchantment. Disenchantment is when a society loses these beliefs that they're a part of a greater narrative, the belief just the religious stories. So uh, uh, Walter Hanengraf, who is a professor of history and hermetic philosophy, he said occultism is an attempt to adapt esotericism to the disenchanted world. Cool. Any questions about all those? I think I'm throwing a lot of big terminology at you guys, but you all seem pretty smart. You all seem pretty smart. Cool. All right, uh, just to let you all know, uh, for anybody who's new, the way that the night is gonna work, those fans feel so good. I'm so glad that it turned those off. But still, and that one is still off. What's happening? Um, so throughout the night, there are gonna be a few of these presentations, and then we're gonna break into small groups for discussion. Uh, so I know that it's a lot of listening right now, um, but in just a few minutes, you're gonna have the opportunity to discuss things in your small groups, okay? Thank you so much for being here, guys. Um, so even though occultism is not anti-science, and that's really what separates it from esotericism, it is necessarily anti-Christian. When we look at the history of occultism, we'll see exactly why 
occultism is so anti-Christian. Uh, but basically, any of the uh, occultist writers, occultist thinkers, or occultists themselves say, say and do things that are extremely anti-Christian. And this is primarily because Christianity uh, has attacked magic and has attacked occultism forever. Forever, you know? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, I had a lot of friends who weren't allowed to read Harry Potter in school because their parents were Christian and because magic is necessarily anti-Christian. It's been so demonized. And the reason why Christianity has demonized magic is because magic, uh, it subverts the power hierarchy that is found in institutionalized religion. So in magic, you're told that you have the power within you. You have the power. You can chant these chants. You can um, uh, make these symbols. Um, you can use these spells. Um, you can sit and you can meditate and you can cultivate your inner light. You can cultivate your inner power and find it yourself. You don't need, you don't need someone else to tell you, uh, like a pope. You don't need a pope. You don't need a priest. You don't need a father, um, a religious father to bring you closer to God. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Cool. So uh, one line that's said often, hey Claire, I'm sorry guys, I think there should be some more seats somewhere. Um, there are some blue chairs right out here that maybe, if anybody, does anybody have space in front of them or beside them where we can throw a couple of chairs? It looks like there are a lot of people pointing. So anywhere over here, the important thing, we just wanna keep this path here clear. So actually, if I could ask you guys, excuse me guys, hey, um, we just wanna keep this pathway here clear. So it seems like there's some space back here. If you guys wouldn't mind just shifting down, that would be awesome, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Oh yeah, that's a great idea, actually. We can also have you sit right here is fine, yeah? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think it's good, just because we, we do want to keep that one open, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, this is a good problem to have. This is a good problem. You're all very popular. You brought all your friends, thank you. Thank you. So a line that's thrown around in occultist texts relatively often is the spiritual realization of the individual. Uh, that could be summed up as the goal. So every single person in magic or occultism, whatever you're trying to do, you get to create the goal, you get to create, um, uh, the, you get to become the kind of person you want to become through these practices. You create the practices to become the person that you want to become. Uh, side note, guys. I've never really studied occultism before. I don't really know what I'm talking about. So if anybody knows more about this than me, feel free to throw all this in. I had a really weird week reading a lot of books about occultism. <laughs> My brain isn't doing so well right now. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks guys. And back to it. Uh, so again, anybody can practice magic. Um, you don't need the institutions anymore. Every individual holds the power. Um, so because of this, um, many occultists, they do want some kind of religious structure. It gets really kind of aggravating and tiring to be inventing this whole religion for yourself all the time. Sometimes it's nice to have a basic framework to be able to set yourself on, but Christianity is not that framework. So there are many occultists that look to pre-Christian belief systems like paganism. Um, and also, uh, there are others that get influence from um, uh, religions from Asia, so like Hinduism and Buddhism. You might find that there are a lot of fortune tellers that also have a lot of statues of Ganesha in their room for some reason, right? You're mixing together all these different spiritual forms. They normally will not have uh, a picture of Jesus up on their wall. Um, and sometimes they mix together both of these things. Okay. Any questions about all of that? You shouldn't really fully grasp what occultism is just yet, I think. Uh, but at least the idea is that we all kind of have an idea moving forward. Any questions from anybody? Going once? Going twice? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, please. Is 
Cool, yeah. So the question was, uh, is it just Christianity that they're against, or is it Judaism and Hinduism and any other religion as well? Um, so magic is only anti-Christian. Um, it, se <laughs> it seems like. It seems like magic uh, and, and occultism is only anti-Christian because it's been so demonized for so long uh, by the Christian establishment. It doesn't appear as though other religious institutions have demonized occultism and magic in the same way as Christianity, which is why um, magic is is specifically anti-Christian. That all being said, I don't want to rule out the idea that there are Christian occultists. I'm sure that there are Christian tarot card readers. I'm sure that that exists. Um, you can actually really get a, um, there are a lot of videos if you want to find them online of, uh, of yoga and the occult. And um, you can find that Krishnamurti actually <laughs> served a really significant role in the progression of occultism in the West. Yeah. Yes, there are Christian occultists. Okay, are you one of them? Um, more or less, okay. Oh, oh sort of, kind of, I should say. Yeah. Not more or less, sorry. Okay, anybody else? Uh, yeah, please, Robin. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily against each other, because um, when I was reading about Christian occultism, I was thinking about the Christian occultism. I found, I was looking particularly into the magical practices of ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. And during the, when Egypt started to become Christian, they used to use their same magic spells, but with Jesus' name. So you, they used to use the same like principles of practice using the Christian gods, along with their own gods as well. There aren't very many examples of them, but they do exist. Perfect. Alrighty. Thank you very much, Robin. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, did you have one more thing to add? Thing. Yeah, please. Yeah, come on in. It's the same thing with, uh, it's the same thing with um, um, uh, Day of the Dead in Mexico. Mm. It's a wedding between pagan beliefs and Christian beliefs where they <coughs> practice the same Mayan rituals and other pagan rituals, but they use and invoke the Virgin Mary and Jesus. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Alrighty, guys, so now we have the opportunity. Uh, yeah, I think we can take one more. I'm a little bit time, but that's okay. We, got, we have a lot to go through. But uh, yeah, please, please, please. Yes, please. Uh, that there were a lot of examples of magic in the Bible. Ah, okay. So one thing that maybe we'll get the opportunity to talk about tonight is um, exactly how religions differ from magic, exactly why it is that when we use the term magic, we're not talking about religions. And one of the, um, one of the fine characteristics of magic, as opposed to a religion, is that the power is inside of the individual, that in any kind of magical system, there's not a higher uh, worldly authority Authority that you're um, that you're praying to. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing else that holds the power. Whereas uh, in anything that might appear to be magic, like uh, praying to saints, you know, you could look at some of these scented or some of the candles of saintum, and you could say this seems a lot like magic to me. The difference here is that um, the assumption is that the saint holds the power or that God holds the power. Whereas in magic, the belief is that you individually hold the power. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. So um, we're gonna break up into uh, we're gonna break up into small groups now. Um, <laughs> I know that it's very tempting to form groups of like eight people, but I promise your experience here is not going to be as enjoyable if you do that. Um, I really want you guys to get into groups of like four or five maybe six maximum and then cut it off unless, I mean, you can, you're adults, you can do whatever the hell you want. Um, but I, I'd really suggest it. And the question that we have is, do you practice or believe in any forms of occultism, of astrology, tarot, fortune telling, etc.? Why or why not? We have about 10, 15 minutes for this one. I love you guys. And we'll come back in just a little bit. Thank you very much. Well, all righty, welcome back. Thank you very much. Hope that was fun for everybody. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Yep. Yep. So, uh, things have had to shift around a little bit. I hope that's okay with everybody. Uh, normally, throughout the night, we have more and more people stumble in. I don't think that anybody's going to be stumbling in here, though, tonight. If they try, I just don't think that there's any more space. So, uh, with your permission, because it is now nearly 9 o'clock, we're actually going to skip to one of the highlights of the evening. Is that cool with everybody? Is that cool? All right, awesome. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, um, we... Oh, no. One second, please. <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? I don't understand technology. What do I do? What do I do? All right, so, uh, I would like to... There we go. I would like to introduce to you Ms. Ka Dao, Dao um, who is going to be putting on... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, who is going to be putting on a performance for us um, which um, I've actually not gotten the chance to see yet. I've been told this is a performance of Channeling Spirits. Um, if everybody could please silence your cell phones. Um, and uh, if anybody needs to leave now, I'm, I'm just going to ask that this door kind of stays closed for the next little while uh, to make sure that this stays like kind of a sacred space for the next few minutes. Mm-hmm. 
mặt huế tươi tốt chít khăn xanh dường ra vẫn nhụy hồng tô điểm cho màu da ý à ý à nhụy hồng màu dai cổ tay tư hương à đầu vẫn tóc mai vốn dòng công chúa thiên thai à, à. vốn dòng công chúa Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Very different than what I thought it was going to be. That's OK. <laughs> that was really fun. That was really fun. <laughs> oh, man. All right, guys. Um, so uh, we're going to take uh, eight seconds to pull back this table and to pull back the couch. OK. And I believe in you. I believe that you can do it. <laughs> I don't think it works that way. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, Lamai, Lamai, hi, Fum. Uh, can we please push your chairs forward, please? Thank you. Get us all situated with our, our fish feet on. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, so it is 9.13 PM. We've only gotten through about 13 slides of our show of about 78 slides. What's going to happen? I don't know. I think that means that on the fly, I'm going to have to choose what things we get to show and what things we don't. So when we sit on down, um, one thing that I'd like to, like to show you guys, um, I was going to be able to... So my hope today uh, was to bring in Luang Zhang Lao, um, who was going to do some fortune telling and also some ancestor, uh, ancestor channeling. Um, I had the opportunity to meet him today. Unfortunately, he let me know that there was a family emergency that came up and he is not able to come. So if, I know that we were all looking forward to that. I was certainly looking forward to that. 
It seems like that's not going to be happening tonight. But I can tell you a little bit about my experience there today, um, which I know isn't quite as much fun. But it'll be just, just to give you an idea. Um, so this is a temple that was, um, that was started by Lao. Um, and in his temple, um, he had about, when I got there, about 10 different people that were, that were waiting for him. Uh, mostly females, um, and uh, I was hoping tonight to have a discussion about the gender politics within the world of occultism, uh, because one thing that we find is that, especially in the West, it's pretty predominantly uh, female. Um, and in here, yeah, it was, it was 10 women waiting. Um, my, I, I had my assistant there with me who was telling me what was going on, what they were saying, and he was giving a girl advice about how she really should break up with her boyfriend. He didn't have a conversation with her about what's going on in her life. Uh, he's just looking at these cards. And they're not tarot cards. They're standard bicycle cards with the queens and eights and diamonds and suits. And that sure was interesting. Um, so he dealt out these cards. And uh, he just starts saying a few things. And um, the things that he told to me were actually pretty... Um, pretty wild. They were pretty spot on. So um, he let me know that I'd recently gone through a breakup. True. Uh, he let me know that my parents were no longer together. That was true. Um, he said that my mom had a baby uh, before me that died, um, which to my knowledge isn't true, but now I have to go call my mom and find out. Um, he told me that, um, well, uh, he told me that, well, I can't say this. He t <laughs> <laughs> he, t he told me that a lot of women find me attractive. <laughs> And, and he also told me that my health will not be improving. Uh, and he told me that uh, I'm not doing very well at my job. <laughs> Both true. Both true. Both true. Both true. Um, so that was that experience. I asked him if there was anything I could do to improve my health uh, or to improve my job. And he said, that's not his role. His role is not to give advice. <laughs> his role is just to tell me the future. Um, so I don't, I don't get to change these things, right? Um, so that was, that was, that was, that was pretty wild. Um, it was a, it was a free service that seemed like anybody. Yeah, do you have, I, yeah, please, yeah, yeah, huh? Yeah, it was free. I mean, maybe because he was coming to do this event and I was kind of there to vet him, maybe it would be. We can actually get into that. Do you guys, I was able to put together uh, quite a bit of information about fortune tellers here in Vietnam. Is that something that you guys would like to find out about? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, awesome. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Let me get to it. God, there's so much stuff, guys, that we're just not gonna get to. I'm so biffed about this, man. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, all right, fortune tellers in Vietnam. Let's get it. Yeah, pretty cool history here, guys. It is, it is a, it is a pretty cool history. Um, all right, so let's get into it then. Um, so fortune tellers in Vietnam, this uh, was uh, collected from some information that was found online through the journals of Ali Wo and Aing Doi, Aing Zoi. Um, so uh, there's a term, Tai Boi Mu, which apparently is a little bit offensive and I should change it to just Tai Boi. Um, but, and the way that this is, uh, the way that it's translated is blind sage who can tell someone's future. So traditionally, the uh, fortune tellers in Vietnam were blind. And uh, in the past, they wore black silk dresses that they were uh, Dai, um, traditional wooden clogs, and also round spectacles that were made of darkened glass. And um, because most of the fortune tellers are blind, this is why they wore these dark glasses. Now, the dark glasses actually became a part of the kind of costume for fortune tellers. So whether or not they were blind, most fortune tellers just continued to wear these glasses because it is what was expected of a fortune teller. But at least that's, that's where the tradition, that's where the tradition cus comes from. Also, men would often have a wispy mustache or goatee. Um, now, modern fortune tellers, like if you saw Lao there, um, they do not require any kind of costume. Uh, Lao was actually wearing some no knockoff Lacoste when I went to see him there today. Um, and in Vietnam, fortune telling is mostly male dominated. Um, so when you go to see a few fortune teller, you can certainly find females. Most of the fortune tellers that you find uh, will be male. 
So uh, they generally predict luck for the upcoming year. Their busiest time by far is at the beginning of the Lunar New Year, so people can find out what their luck is going to be next year. Um, it's also very popular to find out whether or not the bride and the groom are compatible. This is mostly based on the, their birthday, um, but also based on a lot of other factors that are just intuited by the, uh, by the fortune teller. Um, it's mostly the parents who end up consulting whether or not um, the bride and groom are compatible, although sometimes the bride and groom, they seek out the help of a fortune teller themselves. I was told, maybe anyone in the Vietnamese audience can, can answer this, I was told that um, it's like very common, um, more than 90% of the time, before getting married in Vietnam, uh, you do seek the uh, consultation of a uh, fortune teller, and if the fortune tell teller tells you that you're incompatible, you generally do not marry this person. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you confirm. Yeah, you confirm. Mike confirms. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. So, I, um, I would say like half the truth, but like the fortune teller <laughs> or one of that, uh, that kind can they have do some uh, like magic trick to uh, help you like pass that? Oh, yeah. 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 So yeah. not necessarily yeah. you gonna have to break up. You need to find the good ones so yeah. you can like overcome Pay it. Pay a little more money. In or, I don't know. Or, so this, that's a that's a job. I don't, I don't know. This is another funny story. So basically, if they say you have to marry two times, they actually married that girl and then remarried that girl. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Awesome. Thank you. So you guys know all the secrets now. You know all the secrets. That's good. Uh, it seems like if that's the case, what's the point of even seeing the? fortune teller, but that's okay. Um, so a lot of people also go to help them understand certain misfortunes. So if they have been unable to find a husband or a wife, um, if they've been un unable to get a job, or if their business isn't doing very well, they can consult uh, a fortune teller for this. It's not generally. Like, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your performance. Really loved it. Really loved it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Those crazy Westerners staying up past 10 p.m. Thank you. Good night, guys. Good night. Uh, generally, it's not for marital troubles or workplace conflicts. These are things that are just considered um, uh, to be private matters, and they should just best be handled by the individual, not by the not by the fortune teller. Um, so, in the past, generally, you would find these, in st uh, you'd find fortune tellers uh, at markets or at fairs or at stalls, outside pagodas and temples. But today, yes, yeah? Are things okay? Ah, uh, yeah, can you handle that for me, please? Yep, whatever they say is fine. Yep, thank you very much. Yeah, I have to keep doing my thing now. Thank you. Um, so, uh, mostly, they operate from their homes today. Um, so if you'd like to find, th there are a few forums online that you can find, and I'll actually post um, on the philosophy forum the contact information for a couple of um, fortune tellers. There aren't any that I could find that speak English, unfortunately. Um, so maybe if anybody knows of an English-speaking one, that would be nice to post. Otherwise, I'll, I'll post the one of, uh, that I, the couple that I know, um, and, and you could get a translator relatively inexpensively. Um, there are wealthier fortune tellers um, who operate out of their small homes or from personal pagodas. Now, uh, a fortune teller, the rate varies pretty dramatically. Uh, there are very famous fortune tellers who, to see them, it might cost several millions of dollars. No, several millions VND. Um, but on average, it costs just about 200,000 VND, or about $9 uh, to see a fortune teller. Um, I think that that's all the basic. No, I also have one more. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, the way that they do their predictions, um, generally the most important thing that they use to predict your future is based on your birth date. Uh, this isn't the only thing, of course. Uh, this is kind of the, the most, the, the piece of key, a piece of key information. Um, it's converted to the lunar calendar, of course, if you didn't tell them your birthday in the lunar calendar. Um, and uh, they also conduct palm readings. They use cards like Laum did um, when I went to go see him. I'm so so upset that he's not here for you guys. I really wanted that. I feel like a lot of you came out because of that. I feel pretty bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay, John. Um, <laughs> so, 
Uh, sometimes they do predict participants' futures based on a beetle nut. Um, if you know the, the, the woman, the, um, some Vietnamese women have the, the bright blue, dark blue, blue teeth from eating beetle nut. So they cut one of those nuts in half, um, and then based on the, based on the shape that are ma- the shapes that are made inside the nut, they can predict your future based on that. Um, there is a tradition called, I'm sorry, Cut Tien Zuyen, uh, and it's a ceremony. If you're a person who is approaching 30 and you still haven't found a partner, then you can undergo this ceremony. So it's performed either at a pagoda or at a fortune teller's home. Everybody's pointing at each other right now. That's so uncool, guys. <laughs> so. It, it seeks to address the cause of a person's singledom. Um, generally, the fortune teller will say that the reason for your singledom is because a lover from one of your past lives is holding you back from meeting a partner in this life. So they host a ceremony, cut yen, uh, where uh, they cut, you know the word cut, cut, uh, they cut his or her grip from your life. Cool? Everybody like it? Awesome. Cool, guys. Yes, please, Rob. Got it. Does anybody here know the, the term for having a ghost girlfriend or a ghost boyfriend? Uh, so there's a term in Vietnam for having a ghost girlfriend or boyfriend. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Rob. Uh, all right, so, thank you, Rob. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna take a vote. Um, who votes that we stay a little bit past 10 p.m. to get into some more shit? Okay, okay, cool. Well, that still is only about half of us. Who votes that we don't stay past 10 p.m.? Nobody, all right, that's good news. Okay, cool, all right, <laughs> that's easy, that's easy. Like America, half the people don't vote. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have a couple of things. I still don't think that we're gonna get to everything. Um, I think that Discordianism is pretty cool to talk about. That's very strange. Um, uh, also, I'd like to take you through, we're not gonna get to all of it, um, but at least some of the history of occultism in the world. I think that that's really important to understand. So we're gonna talk about that. But the first thing that I'm gonna do is bring up Ms. Jennifer Kingsley, uh, who's prepared some tarot cards for us. She just wants to show them off for you guys. I think they're really cool. Does anybody in here currently practice tarot? Show of hands from anybody. One, two, kind of, kind of three, maybe four, a little bit of five and a half. Okay, cool. All right, so Jen, let me load these up. I'll give the microphone over to you right now. Um, Is there anything that you want me to ask you? Okay, well then I'll just hand it over. Jennifer Kingsley, everybody! Yeah. I said that there are Christian occultists oh, okay. and that I am what? That like mean? that. So I was born um, to missionaries in South America. My parents and my grandparents are both missionaries. Um, and so I have a very strong, Jesus and I have a very complicated relationship. Pro- Protestant. Protestant, yeah. Um, okay, perfect. Oh, sweet. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Um, so my, my mother actually grew up in a indigenous village where they had um, a medicine shaman who did all sorts of things, and her parents told her that that was demonic. So um, a part of this for me has been a little bit challenging because she saw one of my cards on Facebook and totally thinks I'm consorting with the devil. So um, let, me, let me start with, um, I've always had a huge fascination with the occult. Um, we, uh, specifically with um, the occult, but very much so the, the way that we use symbols to tell stories about our own experience, the way that we make sense of the world, and the way that we didn't know how, and we still don't know how, to make sense of our own experience. And we use a variety of different symbols to do that. Um, we started out, so, so the, the tarot was actually not originally um, a tool of divination. It was originally... Let's see if I got this right. Let's see. Did I do it wrong? Oh, there we go. 
Okay, so this is the very one of the very first tarot decks. Um, it's from the 1500s. It's called the Tarochi de um, Great Sforza. I can't pronounce his name. Um, but it was a pl it was a game. It was a game. It was like a <coughs> card game, like poker, um, that they played in the Italian Renaissance courts at the same time as they were discovering things like. Um, uh, oh, wow. Okay. Thanks. I suddenly got stage fright. That was adorable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so they originally used it, and what was really fun, and I actually really want to do this with my own deck, is that the game was tell, like, take, your, take the cards that you get and look at them and look at the person across from you and tell their fortune. But what you're really doing is telling a hilarious story about them. Like, I know you slept with the Duchess last night. And uh, this shows that the Duke's about to find out, man. You know, it was like that. And it didn't become a tool of divination until the 1700s, um, sort of like 1750 or so. And actually, it was a guy, uh, Eliphas Levi, who um, was one of the first occultists who decided that um, these cards actually showed a lot of things that were um, very apropos to the alchemical path. And the alchemical path is one that every human has the opportunity to take if they decide to. We all start out as the fool, and we go on a journey through our life where we encounter a variety of different things. And Sometimes we are up and sometimes we are down and we have a variety of different experiences. And if we choose, that can be a, a, a spiritual path where we go from being sort of an ordinary, I think, I think actually the term is NPC, non-player character. We just sort of move through the world um, the way we're programmed um, and that's just how it is. Um, but when we start on the path as the fool, we, we open back up to life as, as a little child. And through our encounters with life, choosing again and again to be vulnerable, choosing again and again to sort of choose wisely, um, we, we can become enlightened. We can become the souls of gold. We can become like, like the angels, you know? Um, and actually, I really liked what, what John said earlier about it being a thing, a path that comes from your own self, from, from within. Like, every one of us has the seed to become this beautiful, incredible, enlightened being. Um, and we also, every one of us has the opportunity to not. Um, and so it's really a question of what we individually will choose. So this is the, um, this is the original Italian. Let's see here. This is my, I, I, I decided to build a tarot deck. Um, I've been working on it for about 20 years. Um, but this was, this, uh, this was my very first card. It's the Fool. Um, you can't tell, but that's me. I used to have a lot of curly hair. Um, and the Fool is, is sort of out. Do, 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 do. She has no idea what the world holds. She's super excited to get out there and see it. And um, she's, she has actually everything she needs, but she doesn't know that. She has a compass that will tell her where to go. She has a little new senses that's telling her not to jump off a cliff, which she's ignoring. She has a rose of innocence. She has a bag full of things, which she doesn't have any idea what they are yet. Um, and she steps out onto the path. And her number is zero. She's the infinite egg. She's the cosmic egg. She's not yet even really birthed. Um, and she sort of steps out onto that path. And the funny thing is that while I've been working on this for 20 years, I only started drawing this when I arrived in Vietnam. Um, I really have been figuring out what I wanted to say. Because the tarot is one of those things that you, you can use as divination if you want. Um, and lots of people do. Um, for myself, it's been a tool of self-reflection and self-discovery. Um, She's innocent, she's naive, she's about to fall off a cliff. And she encounters the magician. The magician is the active principle in all of us. Um, and it's the, it's the power that we have to make change on the world around us. It's everything from having the power to get up and go to your job and make money, to um, having the power to invent things that can change the world. Um, as you can see, 
the magician is like, he has actually utilized that staff with all the directions, and he's pulling it through. He's focusing his will. He's got material possessions here with the coins. He has the cup, which symbolizes his emotions and his heart. He has the sword, which is his intellect, the flame, his mind. And then he has the wand, which is connection to spirit. And all of these things have to be brought into a single point for us to actually create effective action in the world. If anything of those is out of balance, we can create chaos for ourselves. But the magician is what created cities. The magician is, is how we use all of the tools around us to become sort of civilized people. Uh, I dig him. Anyway, uh, now the problem with the magician is that he's all action, he's all movement, he's all get out there and go. And a lot of us are really used to that. We're all on the treadmill, we're all running as fast as we can, we're all trying to make something of ourselves. The high priestess comes next and the fool en encounters the um, the magician first to discover that yes, she can act and it changes the world. And then she discovers that when you act and you're changing the world, that can go really awry. That can really get messed up. That cannot work the way that you want it to. Um, and so she next encounters the high priestess, which says, shh, sit down, be quiet, listen. Things have not gone the way that you thought they would and that's because you're not listening. You're not hearing your own inner voice, your own spirit. Every one of us has something inside of us that tells us the truth about ourselves and about our life and about our world. But it's very, very quiet. And it takes time, it takes peace, it takes stillness to hear. And when we are out there juggling a thousand things and we are making money and we are hustling our bums and we are trying to make it all happen, we can miss it. We can miss why we're doing it. So this, the, the priestess is great because she's not about telling us what to do. She's about giving us space to do it, to listen. Okay? And then this was really interesting. So I came up with the empress at the exact same time as, I don't know, do you guys remember when they had, um, I mean, it's been just recently in the United States, they had a big court case with the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh and uh, Dr. Ford. Um, so I was drawing this at the same time as we were having this whole crisis in my country about who gets to be believed, what gender power is about, sexism and, 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 and domination of males over females and females standing up for themselves and the whole nine yards. And at the same time, I was drawing this incredible, delicate, I mean, the empress is everything that traditional women are meant to offer the world. Um, she's a creatrix, she's gentle, she's, she, calls, she brings life to everything that she touches. She's abundant, she can be a little emotional. She's, she's all of those things that are traditionally female, right? Um, and I found myself really struggling with this because for as beautiful as she is and for as much as she protects and, and, and you can see like she, she's, she has wisdom there, she has all of these different hands doing all of these different things. And yet, somehow this model isn't working for us. It's not real for me in the same way. I'm not this kind of woman, you know? Um, and, and, I, and I started drawing the emperor, which I do not have finished, so I can't show you that one. Um, but I think that this is, our, this is our history. You know, we all come from a place where women had one role and men had another role, and we are all living in a world in which that, those lines are blurring, and we're not those things anymore. And we don't have to follow the rules that were set for us, but that means there are no rules. That means that more than ever in the world, we need to be listening to that priestess. We need to be going inside and listening to our own heart, because if we don't, we aren't, we, we, aren't gonna, we aren't gonna know what to do next. We're not gonna know how to navigate next. And one of the things that I love about the tarot is that it really allows you, when you lay out the cards, it's not so much that it's telling you your future, it's telling you your present. What's happening now for you that you don't wanna look at? What, what, what's the truth about your life that you're not willing to actually own up to? But you are because you went and got a tarot reading. So you're ready. You're ready, but you're not ready. 
So um, I love the Chirot because it's an action of bravery. Um, for me, it's an action of bravery personally because I'm having to get into fights with my mother about it. <laughs> um, and I don't, I, I am not somebody who uses it in a divination sense. Um, I know that there are lots of people who do, and I, I totally, absolutely respect that. I, I wish that I could speak more to that. But I really think that the Tarot and this journey that I'm on with the Tarot, um, the card after this, the card after the, um, the Emperor and the Empress is the Hierophant, which is like the Pope, and he tells you, you are not vegan enough, and you are not meditating enough, and you are not Christian enough, or Buddhist enough, or you are not, you are not skinny enough. All of these things that say, what stands between you and God? What stands between you and feeling good about yourself? What stands between you and righteousness, right? The one after that is the lovers, and what breaks that is love. So um, I'm pretty excited to see where it goes next, and I have a blog. You guys can come on and check it out and see what I find out about the lovers after that. I'm going to let it go because I know we don't have a ton of time. Um, that's all I got. And please, please, if you have questions, you can ask me later. Isn't she great? Isn't she great? Wow. I could listen to her talk for hours. Wow, really nice. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Wow, that was so cool. So we just got to see some two pretty cool things. Um, so the, um, the dance that we got to see uh, was about channeling the spirit of Mother Goddess. Um, and then these demonstrations of the tarot cards um, are about um, maybe predicting the future. Or like Jen said, it's even a bit about pre uh, knowing more about what's going on for ourselves right in the present moment. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of time um, to break up into small groups. After this, we're going to have a cool talk. It's not very long on Discordianism, which is my favorite weird kind, if anybody knows, good. It's a very strange kind of um, spiritual, anarchi a anarchistic, um, semi-psychedelic, it's like if, if Douglas Adams made his own religion, um, kind of esotericism. And then after that, we'll, we'll take a look um, briefly, at the, uh, briefly at the history of uh, occultism, which I wish that we could s have spent the whole night on. It's so damn cool. And maybe in the future, we will have a whole night just on the history of occultism. For now, this is what we got. So. Um, we're, we're gonna break up once again into small groups, um, and we're gonna we're gonna discuss: um, Is fortune telling even possible? Is it possible what we're trying to do? Is communicating with the dead possible? Um, so we'll take uh, let's say about ten-ish minutes for that, and then we'll come on back, and then we'll have two more presentations. We'll hear from Laura Hardy Stewart, and we're gonna call it a night. Grab a drink, use the toilet. I'll see y'all in a little bit. Next we have the yes oh it's working woohoo okay so next we have the haikus thank you so much Nash thank you for the music for being my go-to tech man all right now you're a pizza it's not delivery it's supernatural <laughs> number two I'll bend you will clap I would never stop to dance my muse never dies. Number three, I will make you dance. You cannot resist it, no. This is my power. They work in a sequence. They work in a sequence. Um, all right, so everybody ready to clap? You think your favorite one? You've got it in mind? You've got it in mind? Oh, no, 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 no. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Go back. No, just wait, just wait, just wait. Shh. Okay, all right, so round of applause for pizza. Woo! Round of applause for bending. Woo! And for I will make you dance. All right, I think that's a pretty clear winner. Who wrote this one? Who wrote this one? Yeah, Brian! Woo! Excellent, thank you so much. That was really nice, really nice. Uh, so please grab a drink on the house, whatever you want, whatever you want. Thank you. Good job, guys. These are excellent tonight. These are excellent. Uh, so uh, I did contact Laura Hardy Stewart well before this event, and she put together uh, a nice image for us for the occult as well. Capra Occulta.
Alrighty, guys. So, first, I'd like to tell you about my favorite little piece of occultism. It's Cordianism. Discordianism. Anybody here of Discordianism before? Any Discordianists in the audience? Yes? Yes? Okay, good, good. I need to stop doing that. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Discordianism. I'll go through a brief, brief history of occultism. We'll have one more discussion, and then I think that I'm going to let you get out of here. Stay as late as you want. Thank you so much for coming, guys. All righty. So Discordianism is based on the worship of Ares, who's the goddess of chaos, of discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and international relations. Uh, Discordianism, as an occult following, came into being alongside the psychedelic religion of the 1960s, which was championed by Timothy Leary, right? So in the same way that we were really viewing psychedelics as a kind of religion, uh, Discordianism followed suit. So virtually every aspect of Discordianism is a joke nested inside of another joke. This doesn't mean that it's not powerful. It means that it finds just a lot of value in play, right? Maybe there's a chance that in the same way that, say, Stephen Colbert or The Onion or any kind of satirical news source actually says more about politics than any of the real pundits, maybe there's a chance that a satirical religion, a, a satirical esoteric following, says more about reality than, um, than any proper religion. I think that's worth exploring. All right, so there are three core principles of Discordianism. The first is order, the second is disorder, and the third is that neither one of these exist. Both order and disorder are mere illusions. Um, it's unknown exactly how many Discordians there are in the world, and this is primarily because Discordians are not required to hold Discordianism as a belief. Uh, number two, it's also because Discordianisms, uh, Discordianists are encouraged, are encouraged to form schisms, that is, like, to break off into little Discordian tribes and cabals. What are cabals? Uh, cabals are small groups that believe different, d d believe different things than the other groups. Yeah, so it's basically the same as... The schism is the fight, the cabal is the group of people that form after the fight. Uh, so the primary text of Discordianism comes from Principia Discordia, uh, or How I Find the Goddess and What I Did to Her When I Found Her. <laughs> uh, so this is the sacred text of Discordianism. Uh, originally, there were only five copies that were printed in 1965. You can find it online, though. You can buy it off Amazon, wink, wink. Or um, if you want to, you can, uh, you can just download it for free. You can find it online. Uh, so it's considered to be the magnum opiate from Malaclips, the younger, uh, a.k.a. Greg Hill, and Omar Khayyam Ravenhurst, a.k.a. Carrie Thornley. Um, this uh, whole text began after a holy vision that took place in a bowling alley sometime either in 1957 or 1958. We don't really remember. Uh, the Principia was first presented in this bowling alley on a scroll by a chimpanzee. Within the Principia, there are a few core concepts that I'd like to go over with you guys. You better be paying attention. Uh, concept number one is the law of fives. The law of fives. Uh, so in Discordianism, there are no dogmas, but there is one katma. And the one katma is that everything in the universe relates to the number five one way or another, given enough time, ingenuity on the part of the interpreter. <laughs> Uh, all things happen in fives or are divisible by or multiples of five and are somehow directly or indirectly appropriate to five. <laughs> so in the Eurasian archives, uh, that is the archives of texts that are devoted to Ares, the god of disorder, um, the goddess of disorder, um, in an old memo, memo from Omar to Mal II, um, Omar says, I find the law of fives to be more and more manifest the harder I look. The law of fives is never wrong. That's the law of fives. Everybody got it? Good. Uh, so being that there are, uh, being that everything comes in fives, rather than having a Ten Commandments, within Discordianism, there are five commandments, collectively known as the Pentabarf. <laughs> know ye this, <laughs> O man of faith. Number one, there is no goddess 
but goddess, and she is your goddess. There is no Eurasian movement but the Eurasian movement, and it is the Eurasian movement, and every golden apple core is the beloved home of a golden worm. Number two, a Discordian shall always use the official Discordian document numbering system. Number three, a Discordian is required during his earliest illumination to go off alone and partake joyously of a hot dog on a Friday. This devotive ceremony is to remonstrate against the popular paganisms of the day, the Catholic Christendom that there is no meat on Friday, of Judaism that you shall not eat the meat of pork, of Hindu peoples that you shall not eat the meat of beef, or of Buddhists, no meat of animals, and of Discordians, no hot dog buns. Number four, a Discordian shall partake of no hot dog buns. And number five, a Discordian is prohibited of believing what he reads. It is so written, so be it. Hail Discordia, prosecutors will be transgressicuted. <laughs> I'd like to recount to you guys the curse of Greyface, if I may. The Curse of Greyface starts off in the late 12th century BC, uh, or the early 12th century BC, I think that's right. Uh, there was a humorless, malcontented hunchbrain named Greyface. I'm sorry that the text here is small, I won't do that to you guys again. Uh, he believed the universe was humorless, and he preached that play was sinful because it contradicted the ways of serious order, which was the bedrock of the universe. This deluded honest men to believe that reality was not a happy romance, but a straitjacket. It's unknown why anyone thought to observe all of the disorder around them and not to conclude the opposite. So Greyface and his followers took the game of playing at life more seriously than they took life itself. They began to destroy other li living beings whose ways of life differed from their own. Mankind has since been suffering from a psychological and spiritual imbalance. Imbalance causes frustration. Frustration causes fear. And fear makes for a really bad trip. Man has been on a bad trip for a long time now. It's called the curse of Greyface. Discordianism, everybody! <laughs> oh, no. If you're interested, you can become a pope of Discordianism. Um, <laughs> according to the Principia Discordia, every single man, woman, and child on this earth is deemed a pope from birth. Um, <laughs> there's an official pope card that you can print if you buy the text or if you find it online. Um, the papacy, however, is not granted to you by owning this card. It's granted to you from birth. Um, the card is more helpful in case you're confused. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to... Oh, quickly. I do want to get you guys out of here. Though this is really fun. So uh, can I do this? And then we'll have one more discussion, and then we're going to go. Does that sound good to everybody? Is that cool? All right. Thank you. I love you all. Thank you for letting me do this. This is such a strange thing to do with my time. <laughs> okay. All right. The history of occultism. Dun, dun, dun. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. All right. Uh, I think it, it might actually get a little serious. So I'm just, I'm gonna spat out some, some information at you and I hope that you guys learn something from it. Um, okay, so, uh, originally, occultism and science, they weren't actually at odds with one another. Today we think of occultists as being hyper, uh, maybe irrational or unscientific, but that wasn't actually the case. There was really no distinction between science and magic way back in the day. All scientists were also exploring literature, philosophy, cosmology, and religion. They were all just linked up in one. So many of the most famous thinkers that we can think of today, they, if they believed what they believe today, would be discounted as being occultists or magicians or whatever. So Galileo, for instance, uh, he taught astrology to medical students. Uh, he believed in astrology. It's how he made most of his money throughout his life was by um, hosting astrological readings for the wealthy. 
Uh, Isaac Newton was an alchemist as well. Once again, he thought that uh, he thought that his discovery of gravity um, wouldn't be very well received by anyone for fear that it would be thought to be just a part of the occult. Uh, Tycho Brahe, anybody know Tycho Brahe? You went to school. Cool. All right. Uh, so Tycho Brahe, um, he publicly lectured against anyone who believed astrology was fake. And he convinced everyone he was a sorcerer. And he did this um, by creating these, this is real, these little automatons that he had uh, ride, all around his, uh, ride all around his house, uh, performing these strange tasks. Um, and he would convince everyone that he was able to make all of these, te- these things happen, not because of technology, but because he was a sorcerer. Um, so, and even if we think about it today, even though we kind of draw this line in our head about science versus um, occultism and these strange beliefs, actually science today is touching on subjects that magic and spirituality and philosophy and religion have been touching on forever. For instance, science today is talking about time travel. They're talking about the ability for perception to alter reality, talking about parallel universes, etc. Where exactly is the line between what is magic and what is science? We can trace the origins of what we might call occultism or magic back to the Babylonians. And the Babylonians, um, they, they, we, we know a history of them going all the way back to about 4,000 BCE, about 6,000 years ago. Uh, the Babylonians, they measured planetary movements, they invented the abacus, they invented the first sequential numbering system, they invented the earliest forms of astrology and of astronomy. Um, they, they regarded their knowledge as being divine. Um, for them, divination, uh, not just for them, but for everybody. So divination is attempting to understand the will of God by studying the stars, by studying mirrors, by studying crystals, by studying tarot cards, anything so that you can better understand God. It's like um, you look up at the stars and you must assume that this is the language that God speaks in. Um, and, and understanding that language is what they were trying to do, the Babylonians. Um, this is the Babylonian numbering system. Uh, one of the earliest, I think the earliest numbering system that we have. Um, it's base 60, which um, helped them uh, count, um, it helped them count the minutes in an hour. Um, it also helped them count uh, the number of degrees in a circle because 60 so easily um, will divide up 360 degrees in a circle. So then the Egyptians, uh, around the 32nd century BC, after the Babylonians, they, uh, they had gotten most of their knowledge, most of the things we know the Egyptians to be really well known for um, um, in terms of mathematical or scientific progress, actually comes from the Babylonians. Um, they used ceremonies and incantations and symbols and spells to affect the world. So they believed that with these things they could heal the sick, that they could make crops grow, and they believed that their powerful knowledge did not come from the Babylonians. They believed that it came from the god Thoth. Uh, so um, the Egyptian god of language was Thoth. Um, he was also the god of writing, of astronomy, of mathematics, of science, and of magic. Um, so the occultists, if you ever talk to the one, uh, they might mention to you something, the Book of Thoth. Has anybody heard that before? The Book of Thoth, yeah, a lot of us have, okay. So the Book of Thoth is not really a real book. Um, Some people think that it's a real book, just like people think that the Philosopher's Stone is actually a real stone. The Book of Thoth is not a real book, but it exists perhaps only in what we might call the astral plane, or it might exist only kind of metaphorically. And we can contact this through channel, uh, we can contact this through forms of meditation. Um, and we can begin to, um, if we clear our minds, if we sit and we clear our minds um, and we focus on the flow of a candle, uh, of a, the flame of a candle, um, then we can begin to tap into, uh, with, if we have the intention to channel this wisdom, we can begin to tune into this wisdom. Um, some people say that even the pyramids, the sphinx, Uh, And all of these statues that the Egyptians had built, maybe these are actually the pages of the Book of Thoth. We don't know really why the Egyptians built all of these things. Maybe what they were trying to do was communicate to us, to future generations or to others, this divine wisdom that they that they learned while um, communing with the divine uh, through these uh, ceremonies. Any questions about Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Book of Thoth. 
Okay. Cool, guys. Cool. Uh, so, in the early 13th century BCE, Ramses II died. Um, the invading army that came into Egypt. Um, all of the occult wisdom, we believe, was actually lost until about the 13th century, right? So for 2,000 years, um, all of this knowledge was lost about the Egyptians. It was Venetian traders that began to spread the knowledge from Egypt out to the rest of the world. Um, okay, now we're gonna kind of change, we're gonna shift here a second from Egypt to Greece. Um, and we're going to take a look at Pythagoras. Now, Pythagoras lived um, from 570 to 495 BCE. He was an ancient Greek philosopher, and he traveled the whole globe in search of knowledge that had been lost, in search of knowledge that wasn't in his library that he didn't have access to, and he wanted to try to fit it all together into one text, into one book. He synthesized all of these elements of various occult practices from around the world into a new discipline, and this discipline he called philosophy. This is kind of what we're doing in here. So, um, philosophy had certainly existed before this time. Aristotle predates Pythagoras, as does Socrates, as do the pre-Socratics, as do many philosophical thinkers. He was the first person to call it the study of philosophy. So, when we talk about the history of occultism, what we're talking about, in a way, is the history of philosophy. Like, can anybody in here give me a real definition of philosophy? What is it that we're doing in here? What are we doing? Huh? You love wisdom. Okay, awesome, cool. So we love wisdom. So we're trying to get at, and what is, what is wisdom true? It's the application of knowledge. So wisdom is the application of knowledge. So we're trying to get at a way to, well, so if we understand things, we first have to get the knowledge, and then we can figure out the way to apply it. Um, and uh, what Pythagoras believed, what the occultists believed, and um, what early philosophers believed, and philosophers of today believed, is that there are there's knowledge that we can tap into um, by, oh, there's knowledge that we can tap into through these kinds of ceremonies, um, through these kinds of incantations, or just by noticing the patterns that exist naturally in the world. Um, one of those patterns is numbers. So Pythagoras, you all probably know him because of the Pythagorean theorem, Pythagoras uh, believed that numbers was the language that the gods used. He believed that this was the language that was best um, uh, that was possibly best applied to understand the universe. Um, we can't maybe understand the whole world in, um, in sp spoken language, like what I'm doing right now, but maybe with mathematics, maybe with numbers, we can begin to get at what the fundamental properties of the universe are. And we see this still today. So there are these mathematical constants that we really don't understand. Today, when we learn these in schools, I think that we don't appreciate how mystical these things are. We don't understand what pi is. We don't understand why the speed of light is the speed of light. But these are mathematical constants that we find. When these things were first discovered, they thought that it was a signal from God. And I think that we've lost connection from that so far. Okay, moving on. So Pythagoras, he opened up a school. Man, I wish that I had more time for these guys. It's already 10.20. Uh, he did a lot of work with music as well. Say it, say it. <laughs> Skip him, okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think that's fine. Yeah, you guys can see the slides if you want to. Oh no! I think that if we, I think that if we skip it though, then a lot of the story is gone, and I don't want the story to be gone. We might just not have time for this. I might just be trying to fit too much in. I hear myself talking, and I feel like I'm rambling. What are you saying, Robin? In two parts. Come back another time. Well, is eight to eleven too long? Is that just is that too long for people? <laughs> Can I get a show of hands from people who wouldn't mind it being extended until eleven? Okay. Jesus, that's unbelievable. You guys are freaks. You guys are so weird. All right. All right. Well, do you guys do you guys want to keep hearing about this? Yes. Yes. Okay. If you're bored, let me know. I find it to be very cool, but I also feel like history lessons aren't the most fun thing, so I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Okay, all right, moving on, moving on. Okay, so, um, does everybody, everybody's familiar with the Dark Ages, right? 
Yeah, Food of the Dark Ages. Okay, so this was a period of about a thousand years, uh, from the fifth century to the fifteenth century. And during this time, Christianity suppressed culture. They suppressed the sciences. They suppressed basically everything except for religion. Christianity and politics were tied together in bed. I was told you're not supposed to do this in Vietnam. Um, they were they were tied they were tied together. Um, so Christians had extreme political power. Once again, we talked about this a little bit before, but magic was particularly under attack because magic subverts the power hierarchy. There were all of these people that were coming up with um, that were coming up with ways to manifest the light that's inside of you, much like what Jennifer was talking about, ways to manifest this power inside of you that you don't need a church, you don't need a pope, you don't need a priest. You can do all of these things on your own. And when you do that, because the power is inside of you, you don't need the church anymore. The church loses its power. The church loses its money. So magic, certainly during the Middle Ages in particular, um, was targeted and, um, and was quashed as much as possible. I think we got all those things. Cool. Okay. So, so there was a, then a genre called Paracelsus. And this is in the late 15th to early 16th centuries. And Paracelsus was around during the German Renaissance. Um, he was a German physician, an alchemist, and an astrologer. Um, now, Paracelsus is pretty well known for what he was able to accomplish in, in uh, medicine, um, but he actually did not complete his his proper degree, um, he was forced out of school because of what he was trying to explore in the worlds of alchemy and the worlds of astrology. Um, he spent most of his life as a nomad um, supporting himself by um, performing these astrological readings. So looking at your own birth chart and finding out what your birth chart said about who you are as an individual. <laughs> He, he devoted several of his sections of his writing to the construction of an astrological talisman for curing diseases, again, something that was not respected by um, conventional medical institutions. And he traveled around the world, much like Pythagoras, gathering as much occult knowledge as possible from anyone that he could talk to, from barbers, from witches, from midwives, from village healers, from anybody. Okay, and then we come to the Corpus Hermeticum. So the Corpus Hermeticum, um, was compiled in the 15th century, although the content within the Corpus Hermeticum is far, far older. So there were two gentlemen, one by the name of Marcello Ficino, and another one, Cosimo del Medici, who you might actually, you might be familiar with Medici. Um, so they acquired and they translated a, a collection of texts from ancient Egypt, or at least what they believed was ancient Egyptian wisdom. So you remember, um, the Egyptians, they had all of these incantations, these different spells, uh, these different beliefs that they would use to heal people, that they would use to commune with the god. But then after the fall of, um, after the fall of the second um, Ramses um, and the fall of ancient Egypt, most of this knowledge was, uh, was gone. Well, we believe that this text held all of this ancient wisdom from Egypt. <laughs> oh no. I feel like I need to say all of this with this strange caveat of like, I don't want to say this is truth, you guys. I just, wanna, I just wanna say like, this is what a lot of people who are occultists believe. <laughs> and okay, all right, uh, as long as that's out of the way. Um, so, um, re reputedly, this was authored by an Egyptian magician named Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus, okay. And it was full of uh, theories of occultism, of esoteric doctrines, alchemy, magic, astrology. The thing though is, guys, Hermes Trismegistus never actually existed. Um, so uh, Hermes uh, is the Greek god, and Trismegiscus, uh, we think, actually comes from this god Thoth. So someone had formed together, had joined together the teachings of Egypt with the teachings of Greece to develop this text called the Corpus Hermeticum that you can find online and you can read it, and it's really strange. And I'd suggest maybe checking it out. Um, it, was, uh, it was translated by these two men, and I'll skip some of this stuff for time. Okay, so 
Um, the Corpus Hermeticum is a compendium of both Greek and Egyptian lore, and it was full of ways that an individual could cultivate themselves to become enlightened, and how an individual could raise their consciousness until they were like gods. This was the goal. Um, unlike uh, a Christian text that talks about some other world up there, this was talking about, this was using metaphors to help us understand the worlds in here, and even ceremonies so that we could externalize the battles that are going on in here to better understand them and make changes within ourselves. This also contained what's called the Emerald Tablet. The Emerald Tablet is considered to be the Bible of Renaissance, of Renaissance occultists. And it contains within it this line, which if you study occultism, I, is everywhere. As above, so below. The way that the stars appear in the sky, that actually tells us more about what's going on in Earth and tells us about what's going on inside of our own brains. As above, so below. So we want to use astrology to better, to we understand what's going on up here in the sky. And through a study, what's going on up here in the sky, then we can better understand what's going on down here. Yes? Um, it's also fractals. Yeah, okay. So um, does anybody know about fractals? So a fractal is any pattern that as you zoom in, the pattern remains exactly the same. So if you imagine just a spiral is a very simple fractal. It doesn't matter how far you zoom in to the center of a spiral, it will always appear to be the same. Everybody can visualize that, right? Everybody can visualize that. And if you look at something like Fibonacci sequence, the, the golden ratio, it's the same thing, right? The further you zoom in, it just seems like it's always going in the same exact pattern. So the pattern that exists in the sky, um, we are just one piece of this fractal pattern, maybe just looking at it from different, um, from different vantage points. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really not an expert on any of this stuff, guys. It's just been like a really lonely week of, hey, thank you, thank you. Okay, awesome, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so, um, in the Corpus Hermeticum, it also says that humans uh, are actually special. They're, they're different than basically every other creature that exists. Um, and we have a divine nature, and we, human beings, have the potential to tap into divinity in a way that basically no other creature does. Um, that through proper teachings, through proper cultivations, cultivations, we can transcend morality and return to what's called the ultimate state. We can find our own divine nature. Uh, any questions about the Corpus Hermeticum? Yeah. You're saying you had one. You said you had a copy? <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, go, just say it, and then we'll move on. All right, well, my thought was, is if we're a piece of that fractal looking at it from different directions, who's looking at us and says, that's a fractal? And that was you. Thank so, you. Those kinds of comments are always welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, none of us really want to be here, do we? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, so it was during this time that we also had the study of... Alchemy. Um, has anybody in here studied alchemy before? Yeah? Alchemy is super cool. I remember learning about it in high school and being told that it was the study of turning lead into gold. Everybody knows that one, right? Wrong! Little did you know. Yeah, okay, so kind of. So it is the practice of turning lead into gold. Um, but uh, again, many of these practices, many of these ceremonies and rituals, the, the idea here is that we have an external representation of what's going on inside of ourselves. So through the process of externally turning lead into gold, we're given the opportunity to turn the lead in ourselves into gold, right? That that is, it's, it's, a, um, it's kind of an, a, a metaphor, a representation, but one that has real power when we witness this. So alchemy was practiced since the early Egyptians. But in the Renaissance, it actually reached new heights. Now, um, it was said that it was possible to heal illness and convert lead into gold, but like I said, that's not really the point. Um, now, much of what we practice today in modern science is actually developed by the alchemists. So, um, observing and documenting results in scientific experiments, um, as far as we know, this is something that was really mastered by the alchemist and something that we definitely do today part of the scientific method. Um, they were also the ones who discovered 
discover the elements of phosphorus, zinc. They discover the distillation of alcohol. They also were the ones to discover that diseases come from germs that we may or not be able to actually see. So they discovered a lot, even though their goal was convert lead into gold, they discovered a whole lot along the way. This is something that we find to be true of almost all occult practices. You say that you have a particular goal, i.e. converting lead into gold, but the real value of the practice is found along the way. It's not really about getting there, it's about the process. The alchemists were also the first to understand the way that blood circulates throughout the body. There's a gentleman called John D, who I was excited to discover. Um, so John D is pretty well known because he straddled the worlds of both magic and modern science. He was a scientist, he was an inventor, a mathematician, a cryptographer, a navigator, an astronomer. He was also an occultist, a sorcerer, an alchemist, a hermetic philosopher. Uh, hermetic philosopher meaning following the, these teachings of, of Hermes and the Hermetic, um, the, I forget the name of the, the uh, corpus. Yeah, thank you. A corpus Hermetic. Okay. Um, uh, so, but um, he wasn't uh, somebody that was just kind of viled by normal society. He was the court astrologer for Queen Elizabeth the First, and he actually had a lot of political sway for this for this reason. Um, he devoted the final thirty years of his life to communicating with angels, and his goal here was to figure out what the universal language is of creation so that he could better understand why it is that we're here and what our goal is, what we're supposed to do. A lot of these guys want what the will of the gods is. They want to find what the will of the gods is so we can live our life in accordance to this will. He also wanted to bring about the pre-apocalyptic unity of mankind. He believed that at some point in the past, we'd already witnessed the apocalypse. The apocalypse has already happened. And that before that, mankind was unified and there was no war, there was no hatred, there was no greed. And then there was some apocalypse that occurred. And it's only after this time, we're now, we're, um, we're now experiencing uh, life after the apocalypse. He wanted to find out um, what the world could look like if we were to go back to the way things were before this apocalypse. Has anybody heard of scrying before? Scrying? Anybody know? Yeah? Who knows? Say it again. Yeah? Does anybody know what it is? Yeah? Give us a quick definition. Yeah. Um, you, you can tell things by looking into something. Perfect. Like a crystal ball. Yeah, so you can use a crystal ball. Um, you can use a, an empty glass ball. Uh, you can use the ocean. You can stare at the ocean for a while. And the goal is to not look at the ocean, not look at the crystal ball, not look at the uh, piece of amethyst, but instead look beyond it and see the divine forms that take place while looking at this thing. That's the goal. He was unsuccessful during his lifetime, though, so he never had a lot of success scrying. But he partnered up with a gentleman named Edward Kelly. He and Edward Kelly were working together, and they were scrying using an amethyst crystal. So uh, Edward Kelly, he would look into this piece of amethyst, and um, he would describe to John Dee what it was that he saw, because John Dee never saw anything in the amethyst. Uh, and then John Dee would write down whatever it was. But Edward Kelly actually got a lot more than just, um, just some odd visions. He was receiving messages from angels, and he heard from the angels the language that John Dee was trying to discover, this language of the angels, the uh, language of the world. And this language, he said it was called Enochian. So some people assume that maybe this language was invented by Edward Kelly, um, but other people say it actually has a consistent vocabulary, it has a consistent syntax. The likelihood that without a formal education would be able to invent this language is actually quite low. Edward Kelly claimed to know the secrets of alchemy and to possess, to possess the philosopher's stone, the stone that is able to turn any... Uh, metal into gold. So they toured Europe together 
John Dee, and Edward Kelly. They toured Europe together to be able to share the discoveries, to show off this method of scrying, to be able to show off this new language that they um, intuited, or sorry, this language that they discovered or that they were communicating with the angels through. Um, but around this time, the Christian church began executing any witches, uh, anyone practicing any kind of witchcraft. And during this time, between the 14th century to the 16th century, more than 40,000 people were executed for witchcraft. So they did not have very much success sharing what they found, uh, sharing any of their practices. Uh, this, these are, uh, I believe it's the full alphabet um, of the language that was, that was found to be the language that angels speak, uh, that Edward Kelly was communicating to the, to the angels with. Okay, so that does not bring us up all the way to today. We could get into, we could get into the V, we could get into, uh, you know, Ouija boards and all of the strange kinds of uh, seances that came about in the West in the early 1900s. The history goes all the way up until today, but what time is it now? It's, uh, it's about 1040, guys, so um, I think we, I, I think, I think that what, I, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to call it a night now. I'm gonna call it a night. I love you guys. I wish that we could do this forever. I'm gonna call it a night. If anybody wants to stay and discuss, you are more than welcome to stay and discuss whatever you desire. <laughs> stay here as long as you want. Um, before we really call things, I do need just to say that there are a lot of people that help make this happen. Um, so uh, our performers, uh, Long was not able to be here. Um, King Je Jen Jennifer, if she's still here, thank you so much for your artwork. Uh, Laura Hardy Stewart is not here, but thank you for her artwork. Truett, thank you for leading us through the, the haiku and drawing contest, man. Nosh, your music is killing. Thank you, uh, Andrew and Mom. Thank you so much for videography work to Tu Huai Nguyen for photography to Killian for handling all of the audio and for editing together all of our videos. I thank you so much, guys. Here are some of our upcoming events. Uh, I love you all. Thank you for letting me do this. Stay as late as you want. That's it, guys. Bye-bye.